The following prescription is laid down for the conduct of psychoanalysis. The doctor is not to talk. The doctor is not to look at the patient, but to get out of sight. The doctor is to remain neutral and anonymous in his relationship with the patient. And furthermore, this you will not believe me till you read these papers. And I've even heard leading training analysts, great training centers, say they do not believe this either. But it's written down there as plainly as the nose on your face. Finally, you must not pay attention to what the patient says. Now, the way he says this is, you must maintain an evenly hovering, or in the more recent translation, an evenly suspended attention, because any specific attention to the details of the patient's stream of consciousness will inevitably divert you and force a change or skewing in that stream of consciousness. Furthermore, the meaning of anything, this is Sigmund Freud now, the meaning of anything that you attempt to understand now will really only be understandable much later. So there is no place for formulation, there is no place for discussion, there is only a place for the evenly suspended attention over the, kind of the emerging associations of the patient. So, silence, neutrality, anonymity, out of sight, and not attending specifically to details of the patient's production. That is the invention. So precise in its appropriateness for this particular problem that I call it comparable to penicillin. How could I dare to do something like that? Well, I am not a psychopharmacologist. I am not a pharmacologist. And I only remember very dimly what I was told in medical school about the action of penicillin. And no doubt some of you would correct me, and I hope you will. But my memory will serve anyway to serve as a model for the treatment of psychoanalysis. In the action of penicillin, I understood, perhaps incorrectly, was to enter the cell, adhere to the cell, and then block off the pathogenic agent from affecting the cell. This is precisely what this method of Freud's does. By not attending, by being neutral, by not listening, you offer yourself a silent template, and all the patient's demands to be dependent, all the parentalization of the therapy attaches itself to the, th to the like the pathogenic agent, to the therapy. And the very silent the anonymity sucks, so to speak, all the opportunities for parentalization, for childification, if you like, out of the patient, so it's all present and attached now, attached now to the person of the therapist. Ha! Ah, but precisely the neutrality, anonymity of the therapist defeats that expectation. So that what previously in other relationships in the patient's life has fostered support, helpfulness, and continued parentification is here met by total silence and anonymity. So bit by bit, the patient realizes that they can do it by themselves. So, so to speak, the, the poison of renewed dependent parentification is drawn out of the patient and then bit by bit wiped out by the similar inactivity. So the very formula which draws out the disease, so to speak, serves as the cure. You see why the comparison to the action of penicillin. And my guess is, and, and as in all our judgments as a guide, it's no more than a guess, but my guess is that if you sit with this young woman, in an, as you saw, in an encouraging way, in a hopeful way, the way the good parent does to the child who needs finally to break loose from the family, huh? if you sit there smiling, saying nothing, in, what, in no way encouraging their dependence upon you, in no way suggesting that they cannot make it themselves, indeed fostering any kind of independent acquisition of skills and chances that they take, you'll find that bit by bit she will depart. Furthermore, by your, you know, by your unwillingness to get excited by her terrifying threats of suicide, those will gradually be extinguished because they get her nothing at all. While the more attention you pay to them, the more reinforcements you give to them. Now, anybody in their right mind hearing these remarks, if there is anybody in their right mind today, <laughs> those, may be, those may be self defeating statements. Um, anybody in their right mind hearing these remarks might say, How do I know that that will work? Answer one, I don't. Number two, I think it will. 
And, that, uh, and that's based upon something which is the weakest part of this sequence of arguments, which is how I know when I'm in the presence of a healthy, essentially self-adjusting uh, personality. And I think if you go over that interview, you'll see that she gives many evidences of that. Um, she doesn't do what I would have liked to have her do, and I waited so long and kept you so bored so long because I wanted to see if I could, could demonstrate that, and I didn't, and this is a weak point. When I Usually they also produce these people that are ready to fly, but not quite flying yet. Uh, they usually produce a great deal of triangulation of their experience. So that when they mention the boyfriend, they mention the girlfriend. <laughs> so everything gets triangulated on the model of the edible family, the father, mother, child. And uh, she did do what is characteristic, is that she was self-correcting. I hope you, as you listen to her, you could see her, she'd make one statement, then she'd, a little while later she'd make a statement that indicated that she knew that that was not what she really believed. And so she would keep adjusting herself. Now to me that means she has what the Cohutians would call a sort of self-adjusting or coherent self. And that you don't need to worry about it. You don't need to help her with it. She'll get around to doing it herself, in other words. She's okay on her own. The third thing that I, that I, the, four, the, the final two things that I use as evidence for my willingness to take what seems like a, a risk with such a patient is, well, is her life. Her life goes fine. She's graduating with honors from your great university. She's going on to graduate school in a number of places which she will, which has picked and apparently will appropriately get through. I suspect her personal relationships are much better than she admits. Finally, she also gives an evidence of health that I hope will shake all of us out of our torpor. She gives an evidence of health that I hope will make us all feel sh schmucky, and inadequate, lamb-like, and unworthy of the heritage of our great nation. She, she shows a passion against hypocrisy, an unwillingness to let the status quo Quo rule lives of people. <laughs> she, she is a deeply feeling, deeply feeling, intensely caring individual who does not propose that when she leaves this planet it will be the same. And the causes for which she speaks seem to me unimpeachably correct. Inspiring, in fact. And the example she gives of the man dying in the, in the police station and other things, the causes that she sees our nation suffering from in terms of hypo hypocrisy, which is a theme that runs all through this, seem to be unimpeachably correct. So one can only admire the grandeur of her aims and, and really have confidence that given half a chance, she may well pull off more than any of you and I will ever pull off in our lifetimes. All those things give me reason to believe that rather than my chattering away at her, I might best stand back and admire and hope that I can do as well. So the final reason justifying Freud's silence is there are some people to whom we have probably nothing to say. <laughs> <laughs> now, footnote, final footnote, I'll shut my mouth. Um, I think you will find, and this I'm sure you will be most reluctant to, have some of you will be most reluctant to, I think you will find if you're silent with this woman over a long period of ample confirmation of Freud's great at the psychopathological discovery. He made a great inventional discovery. He also made a great psychopathological discovery, in my opinion. That is, he discovered that many of the people who get stuck at this particular point in life, who, and, and therefore need to be let alone so they can fly on their own, many of these people are stuck in what is called an Oedipal fixation, i.e., either because father loved her too much, or she loved father too much, or mother or somehow was a little bit out of it, or some combination of the great triangular possibilities of family life. She's a little bit stuck in relationship to that family, and she can't quite leave her. Maybe her daddy doesn't want her to go. Maybe she loves her daddy a little bit too much. Maybe she hates his evidence that she and her mother have a very difficult time with together, that your good presenter suggested to her. That, but that as a sticking point to hold people is very often a vital thing. And that will, would I predict, come into the treatment and be gradually resolved, not by your saying anything, not by your interpreting anything, but simply by its, its coming in, getting evident, and she will understand it and interpret it.